joining us. Good morning, Chris and Bree and Jason. And I'm seriously working on fixing this mistake. <laughs> uh, so yeah, welcome uh, to the show. And like we had said, with uh, we had Senator Moylan on earlier, uh, and the joke was kind of like, "Hey, weren't you part of that bill where there was something with an amendment that got snuck in the back of the side and printed out or whatever?" So we had a little laugh about it. But uh, what did you make of the the chain of events that occurred uh, yesterday in session? So you know, I know that some media are dubbing the situation as a walkout, but if I can, and I'll get through this quickly. I really want to give, and you can go back to the video of session, which you guys do a lot of and do a really good job of. If you really watch the chronological order of what happened, when we convened session on Friday, the um, after all of the, the you know the beginning things that we do, the anthem and all the other things that we do uh, to get into session, um, the speaker gaveled down that we were going to discuss the issues surrounding. Bill 130 and the debacle of the amendment that passed that shouldn't have passed that wasn't included in the bill. And when we went off camera, uh, several of us, the five of us Republicans approached the speaker and said, Speaker, we would like for this um, to be aired openly on the air so that uh, the people of Guam can see and it's a transparent process. There was a lot of back and forth on that issue and uh, we did not prevail. And so what happened was there was uh, the beginning of, um, you know, the uh, presentation of, of uh, the, what had happened, if you will. And so what happened was the five of us said, we're not going to participate in this because we've asked you to put it on the record. So we're going to go and uh, have a meeting in the conference room. And that's what we did. Subsequent to that, we came back into session um, and we had the same request. That request once again wasn't honored. And so when we went on session floor, um, the speaker recognized Senator Ada because his bill was up. Senator Ada did not rise to hear his bill because Senator Frank Buzz Jr. rose to uh, uh, a motion. And he made a motion to go back to motions for the purposes of putting on the record the issues surrounding the double call of um, Bill 130. Uh, and um, that was um, uh, objected to and uh, the votes were taken and we didn't have enough votes. Subsequent to that, Senator Bloss asked for a recess so that he can convene with the speaker. When he did that, several of us lawmakers again went to the conference room to have a discussion and Senator Bloss, having not been able to get the resolution with the speaker, joined us in the conference room and we, we didn't go back into session uh, and create the quorum because we wanted to continue to advocate for a public discussion on this mistake. Now, certainly, um, I'm not trying to uh, work around a, mis a mischaracterization or, or call it that, but I wanted it to be clear that what we were doing was trying to continue to compel our colleagues to join us in this effort to put this on the record. So the resolution that came about was all five of us showed up for session yesterday, Chris, at, at around uh, a little bit after 10. Most of them were on time. Uh, I was running a, a, a little bit late. I think I showed up around 10, 10. And we once again convened in the conference room to have a conversation uh, with the leadership. And uh, after a couple of hours, the result was we agreed to come back into session. Uh, I wanna thank the speaker for her leadership in introducing Bill 217, and we agreed to go into session for the placement of nominations on the record for voting next Monday. And we agreed to put only Bill 217 uh, public notice out in order to be able to place it on session agenda. And we agreed that what we would do is dispose of this business before any other business. We agreed that we should play by our rules and make sure that the five day notice was uh, adic was adhered to, and that's what takes us into next Monday. All the other bills were passed on file because many in our group of five continue to believe that there is no way to move forward in confidence that we would debate other legislation and possibly vote on it until we've fixed this issue and until we've addressed uh, what is now being reconstructed as internal controls on the issue with regard to 
in gross bills prior to voting. You know, Chris and Bree, I, I just want to be straight with you. I, I'm not taking a victory lap on this because everybody's got a responsibility here. I am admitting that I did not thoroughly review the bill. And I'm, I'm, I'm on the record saying that. And I'm not making an excuse, but one of the reasons is we have shifted to a new format since I was in the legislature before. Uh, my understanding in the 35th Guam legislature was they went to electronic format for two reasons. One is, is that COVID, uh, they're trying to reduce as much as possible all contact, which means using paper, having clerks walk around and issue paper and everything else, the staff on the floor, they were trying to completely minimize contact. The second, of course, is it's the thing to do. We're in the new age, right? And it's a, it created also savings. You know, there's not truckloads of paper now being required to be delivered to the legislature for the purposes of printing out bills and the like, and it's, it's a savings. In this change, Chris and Bree, what basically um, has taken place is most of the time, since you're not exchanging paper and you're working off of a Google Drive all of the time, the clerks will send you your amendments as you proffered on the floor and as passed. If the amendments have passed, you confirm that the amendment is in the form under which you had proffered the amendment and had it passed. Once that confirmation is done, we assume that the clerks then take that confirmation and place the amendment into the bill and the rest of the text of the bill is as introduced, as heard, and as brought to the third reading for voting. In this instance, I even asked the speaker what, what, what happened with the amendment. Um, and of course, the logical explanation is it was never presented for um, confirmation because it didn't pass. So it should never have been in there to begin with. And so fast forward to right now, um, I think it's important. Uh, I don't know that we actually go back to hard copies, but I think what's important, Chris and Bree, um, we were also under a hurried timeline to vote that night and we should have not voted. We should have stood up. Several of us were asking not to vote. In fact, the staff was worn out and we had to even extend the time when we came back that night to vote. There were very serious bills on that agenda. As you know, we passed the medical campus uh, to the tune of $1 billion. We passed the, the um, bill for the new prison heavily debated in, in Committee of the Whole. A number of amendments were made. Um, and, uh, and we had two state funerals that week. Um, one lesson I've learned is what's, what's the purpose of rushing voting? You're only going in to vote. You know, voting basically takes about an hour. You, you, you're not necessarily staying in session because you've decided to vote. You can push that off by week if you wanted to and uh, not do any other legislative business except for go to our offices and do a more thorough review. And in my contritus apology to the people of Guam, that's what I will do going forward. Senator, so you know this, uh, the amendment in question, um, the amendment, do you know which one I'm talking about? Say again, Chris? The amendment in question, the one that uh, grew legs and inserted itself into the uh, bill? Yes, what, what about it? Yeah, so I know it was a rule of materially different uh, the first time, but do you anticipate any amendments like that one being introduced now that you guys have had a few days to kind of just read the room and see maybe what or how people are feeling about that amendment? I, for one, won't support it, and I would be disappointed if it was proffered, and here's why, Chris. I think that a substantive discussion and the and for the very purpose that it was ruled out of order i believe that this needs a public hearing as a standalone bill where all of the people of guam are able to come to a public hearing and discuss the merits of the program i think the program has merit the problem is is that it's hugely expensive and there is no identified funding source. I wanna, I wanna say once again uh, in identifying um, my appreciation for leadership, the Lieutenant Governor has been on the record uh, so far, I think he's been the spokesperson for the administration saying that they are moving forward with the intent of Bill 130 as passed in public law to prepare a program for the intended $10 million payout estimate for that class of individuals who we need to concentrate on right now. 
survivor. I consider myself, Chris, I don't know if you do, I consider myself a survivor of a survivor. My dad survived. My dad was affected by the war. My dad was affected by decisions made not under his control. My dad actually had to exhume his brother. He is a war survivor. He's not with us anymore. He is a war survivor. I am a survivor of a survivor. I also want to make sure that when we hear this legislation, because I'm going to put on the record now, I will have no conflict of interest because I will not apply for any compensation for my dad's suffering. That doesn't mean that I don't believe in others who firmly believe that they would go forward and do that, and that's their absolute right to do so. But we should do it on the right and proper conditions and situations. We should establish the fact that the funding source is viable and that it doesn't interfere with healthcare, education, public safety, and all the needs of our economy of Guam. Chris, we've got a lot of work to do in the remaining time in this session. We've got to figure out how to shore up tourism. We've got to figure out how to make sure that all these shuttered businesses don't go away forever. We've got to make sure we're prepared going forward into the future. We've got to make sure we can help people who no longer have FBUC or PUA if there's no jobs available. We don't know what the future holds in terms of our, our economy and our tax base when we no longer have all of those millions and millions of dollars coming in because of FPUC and PUA and all the withholding taxes. We don't have a plan for ARP. That's just a short list, Chris. And I am committed, I am committed to if an individual introduces a standalone bill on a secondary program for war claims to work right alongside that committee and vet that process. But it's gonna have to have a viable funding source that does not interfere with the day-to-day -day operations of our government and the service, critical services to our people. Did you see that Lester Carlson interview we did? I haven't had a chance to see uh, Lester's interview. I, I, the only, I think the last one I saw was his um, his basically, uh, you know, comment to us at the legislature that don't worry about the ARP plan. We'll tell you when it's you know when it's your time, and I'm offended by that. How so? How, why am I offended? Yeah, I'm offended because that money was given by the federal government to the people of Guam to rescue the people of Guam. That money was not given to the people of Guam so that political gains can be played, so that individuals can hold on to money and decide winners and losers. That money was given to the people of Guam to help rescue Guam. And I tell you, um, I'm a pretty social guy. You know, I pick up my own groceries. I, I go to the store. I, I fill bottles of water. I do, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out in the public. I don't have people, you know, doing errands for me or the like. And the mood and the temperament out there is help us. And the mood and the temperament out there is do the right thing by the resources that the federal government has given us. And I always have to respond, we have tried. We have given our plan. It's not perfect, but our plan includes tomorrow land trust infrastructure reconstruction so we can help people who are homeless. Our plan includes uh, funding you know, job opportunities. Our plan includes supporting education and retraining for the workforce. Our plan includes, you know, making sure that uh, we can help utilities uh, to stave off increases in, 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 in utility costs. Our plan is very, very detailed. And our plan doesn't include saying that we're going to give $300 million for the purposes of the new hospital when we weren't even, we are not even sure that we could use that. Now, I know Lester says, just read the paper. I told you in the paper that it is allowable. I've not seen the black and white transmission from the federal government saying, Governor of Guam, you're absolutely within your authority to use $300 million for the new hospital. Once again, leadership, I gotta thank the congressman for working really hard to make sure that 360 some million dollars is in the infrastructure plan. 
um, for Guam if the infrastructure bill will pass. If you're watching Washington, D.C., it appears as though um, if the talks break down, the minimum that would pass was the, would be the infrastructure bill. And it is the first infrastructure bill that contains that type of resources or infrastructure. There's your $367 million that obviously is appropriated for these purposes. Help the people of Guam, Governor. That's what we're calling on you to do. And please don't tell the people of Guam that you'll get your plan when you get it because that's not leadership. Senator, what did you uh, make of the, so there's the leap, right? Uh, and then there was the other, what was the other one called, Bree? I think Pertay Linella. Pertay Linella. Yeah. Uh, so there's two different ones. There's one where there's like 25 million, the governor has ponied up 25 million in ARP, and then Senator Shelton is has introduced a measure to get another 25 mil from the general fund and then there's the measure the republicans have right yeah once again going back to leadership mm -hmm. i want to thank senator frank glass jr and to asking me to be a co-sponsor on the bill that allows the governor an additional five percent of transfer authority in order to be able to uh pay um you know this this uh, uh this issue to help uh you know the the tarp plan for the tourism industry. Um, you know, I, I do uh, understand uh, Senator Amanda Shelton's uh, introduction of her bill. The thing is, is that it calls on the general fund. The general fund has not been identified yet. There is no identified funding source. There are, an, there is an unaudited anticipation of upwards of $60 million that the administration has said that the final CRER of fiscal year 2021 identifies. Now our good speaker has some contention with that with regard to prioritizing tax refunds. There might have to be some uh, compromise with regard to that if that becomes a true funding source in terms of a surplus. And that's the reason why Senator Frank Bloss Jr., myself, and Senator Tony Ada did not want to disturb the current budget ceiling. Because if that money has been realized, then it would be subject to appropriation, we believe. And if that's subject to appropriation, then that can become the funding source without affecting the current budget ceiling. You know, we won't, we don't, we want to make sure our creditors continue to watch the fact that, you know, we go to the market from time to time and we want to go to the market to build a hospital and a prison. We want to show that we can live within the budgets that we pass. And so I don't want to, and Senator Bloss and Senator Tony Ada and many of us on the Republican side don't want to tinker with the um, current budget ceiling. We want to make sure that we operate within that budget ceiling. And if there is a surplus, then we can appropriate it. Perhaps uh, I know that uh, the speaker identified at least 20 million from the potential surplus. If it becomes a reality, maybe the balance of that uh, can be agreed upon as the funding source of the transfer authority for the governor. And so um, as far as I'm concerned, we, uh, Senator Frank Bloss Jr., along with myself and Tony and other Republicans, have taken the lead to make sure that Senator Amanda's bill has a funding source. Any word on when um, your bill will be uh, go up for a public hearing? I noticed that already uh, Senator Shelton's bill is already scheduled I've for a public hearing on with, Monday. Yeah, I've had some conversations with Senator uh, Joe. Um, he likes the bill, uh, the chairman, Senator uh, Joe Snogstein. And so I anticipate that uh, he will uh, hear the bill, um, you know, uh, either simultaneously or, or, or shortly after. Um, one thing I think is important is, you know, this program obviously is not designed to dump 50 million Frank and I and Tony are asking for 75 million because that's what they asked for originally. It's not as designed to dump that, you know, uh, into accounts and say, you know, Merry Christmas. It's designed to trickle out, right? So that you help those businesses sustain themselves over the next year, year and a half while we, while tourism, you know, while Governor Gutierrez and his team and everything else go out there and try to shore up tourism and get it back on its feet in Jerry Paris. And so the thing is, is that uh, the governor, since she's identified ARP money, can start the program, get everything rolling, make sure that, you know, uh, the, the, the folks uh, understand the parameters of the program and get it going. And then uh, this, this appropriation coming behind it can show up the program for the balance of the time that we need to uh, take care of our tourism industry. It's the right thing to do. All right. Right on. Do I have anything in closing? I really appreciate you guys. Can I add, add one more thing? Yeah, add two more things. Go for it. <laughs> you know, Bree, I, I think your top story 
although of course so many other things are grabbing headlines i think the top story is the success of the monoclonal antibodies Mm. Over 750, I believe, KOM has taken the lead on this story and interviewed uh, the gentleman who's running that program. And you know what? I just want to be on the record now. I'm not, not a doctor. I'm married to a beautiful nurse who's excellent at what she does. And I want to I wanna go on the record saying now that I believe there's a potentiality that we don't have overflowing um, ICUs and stuff like that. And it's tapering right now in terms of the surge because those seriously ill folks have gotten this monoclonal uh, antibody treatment. I now have four people who I know who have received the treatment, three vaccinated, one unvaccinated. And they say that it was a miracle. Within 24 to 48 hours, uh, they felt uh, no symptoms and they were good as new. So um, treatment, not vax mandates works. I just well, want to say that we did interview one lady who got the treatment, and it was an unfortunate you. situation for her because she popped positive on a Friday, and I think she had to wait through the weekend to get the treatment on a Monday. But she said she got really sick by the time she went to get the treatment, but they still cleared her for it, and then she ended up being uh, pretty ill for a few days. So it was funny because me and Bree, are, she, she's a friend of Bree's, and she wanted to come on, and we were like, oh, that's great, let's get on, because we do want to get the word out about this uh, treatment for exactly the same reasons you just said. But then when she started talking about how uh, she received the treatment and how sick she was for a few days, I was like kind of looking down like, oh, my God, this is not the positive account that we wanted. Well, I no, but she was grateful that she was Yeah, totally grateful. Of course. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, of course, I can't identify my latest friend. Right. But yeah. the thing is, is that here's what he said, which was really, really interesting, because this goes back to the when wisdom that I think we need to continue to use. Right. Dr. When I call it when wisdom. But um, this individual was vaccinated and his original symptom really was just severe back pain. Mm -hmm. And he didn't, he didn't know, you know, like he he hadn't had back pain, you know, as a chronic issue, but it was just so severe and he didn't have some of the other stuff like the headache and and just really the backache. So he just said, you know what, I'm vaccinated, but I'm going to go get tested. He went and got tested and sure enough, he was positive. And so he did, his only severity was, you know, he didn't have troubles breathing. He didn't have any other stuff, but it was that back, severe back pain. Mm. He went there and like I said, within 48 hours, you know, he was, he was good as new. Of course he incubated for the balance of the 10, 15 days, whatever right, it right. took yeah. in order to uh, stay safe and not spread anything. But, uh, but man, I mean, it, think about it. If we continue to get that message out there, you know, you're vaccinated, um, you're fully vaccinated. You might even have a booster, but something happens to where you're like, wait, this is not normal. I got severe back pain uh, or I've got body aches for nothing. I, you know, maybe it's the flu, but maybe because I know already that breakthrough is an issue. I could still have COVID. Go get tested. If you are, and like Dr. Wen said, you're experiencing symptoms, get over there, get the monoclonal and it's there, it's available. And more than likely it will save your life and keep you out of the hospital. Yep. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, you just Senator. want to say, Chris and Bree, have a great day. You too. That food look good. <laughs> I want to go get you one. Yeah, it's three, quarter, three, uh, three, three squares, squares marketplace. Okay, <laughs> get you a chocolate mud pie. Cup. So I, yeah, I'll have to change from my uh, fried chicken, and I go over there. And get <laughs> hey, <laughs> just fried just, chicken is. Let's do both, bomb. man. We're, it's an unprecedented <laughs> well, time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, there you go, Senator Take Chris Wainius. He is the minority leader. We bring him on. Uh, like every other week for the Minority Report. It's 9.05. We're going to take a quick break, and we're coming back with more of the link next. Mariana's Uno here. Mixed. We're mixing it up on the last Thursday of every month with a look at lifestyle, entertainment, food,